Why am I flying the DJI Avata drone? Well, first of all, I have the grey controller from the first FPV drone. And my thinking is that the Avata basically has the upcoming O3 air unit in it. The only difference being that the Avata has a one axis gimbal. And knowing DJI, the O3 air unit probably isn't going to be quite as good as what they put in the Avata drone. So the idea is to gauge whether it's going to be a significant upgrade from the current air units and vistas. However, this was massively overshadowed by how extremely unusable the new DJI Goggles 2 are. But before I get onto that, I do want to mention that when you are flying the Avata drone, the Electronic Image Stabilization, or Rocksteady V2 as they call it, is not done in real time. So the only smoothing experience you get when you are flying comes from the one axis gimbal. Rocksteady is applied to the video file after you have stopped the recording and it gets saved to the SD card or the internal storage of the drone which is why the footage you are currently seeing is all jittery because I don't get on well at all with small controllers. Now they have given us the option to turn Rocksteady off and use gyro data. Maybe it's the same gyro data that they use for Rocksteady. And you can import that into the latest version of Gyroflow and you don't even need to sync the footage up. It's already synced. You just have to tweak the dials to get the smoothing and field of view that you want. But in true DJI fashion, it only records gyro data to the video file when the camera is in wide mode and not ultra wide. You have to turn electronic image stabilization off, of course, for it to collect that gyro data. But any of the other formats like 4x3 mode, meaning that you get, you know, the full field of view, you can't do that. So if you want to use gyro flow, you are going to lose a lot of field of view, kind of forcing you to use Rocksteady instead. And I have no reason to believe that they will attempt to do this with the upcoming O3A unit, but that is speculation. So we all want small and compact goggles, right? But with the same cinema screen type view that we get from box goggles or the older V1 or V2 DJI goggles. And if anyone can pull that off, it's DJI. Unfortunately, this time, DJI has fell into the same trap that Fat Shark did way back when they released their HD2s with a large field of view. Now, goggles are always subjective. Everyone has different shaped faces, our eyes are further apart or closer together, and we have different sizes of noses and different ergonomics of the bridge of our nose. But with the new Goggle 2, everyone, and I'm talking up to 10 people, including flying club members and family members, regardless of their face shape or their IPD, which is how far apart or close together their eyes are, or their eye prescription, they all saw something like this. And I'm a little bit confused because I haven't heard much noise about it, although I haven't looked at a lot of the coverage. Well, I'm not completely confused because when the HD2s came out, no one talked about it either until weeks later when they got into users' hands or some people actually didn't mind the blurred edges as long as there was a huge view on the screen. And if you were really lucky, there was a millimeter sweet spot where maybe three people saw the entire image perfectly without any vignetting or any blurring, but for me, it was totally unacceptable then, and it's unacceptable now. And the goggles too have exactly the same issue. By the way, this is not the only problem with the goggles. It's just a lot to unpack, so bear with me. 
Now, there was a time when Fat Shark did actually talk to me, albeit through a podcast. And they explained that when you make goggles smaller, and of course, one of the benefits of the new goggles too is that they are much smaller, there's only so many adjustments you can make when it comes to the IPD and field of view because there is simply not enough room or real estate for the mechanics to push the boundaries any further. By the way, this smeared view was set at 90% scaling of the screen size. So it's not even 100%, which is 51 degrees field of view. So just like the last DJI goggles, they've put an image scaler into the user interface. We assumed with the last goggles that the screen was so big, people might want to downsize the image because they are simply not used to it with previous FPV goggles having maybe a 40 to 46 degree field of view and they might get motion sickness from a 54 degree field of view which the previous V1 and V2 DJI goggles had when set to maximum. This time the image scaler has got to be because they know that most people are going to get extreme blurring and vignetting at the edge of the screens. And this stops for me when the image scaling is set to 80%. Now, DJI say that the eye distance range, IPD for short, is 58 to 70 millimeters. And I'm someone who has to have all FPV goggles, regardless of the brand, maxed out to the sides. So 70 millimeters versus the V1 and V2s, which is apparently just two millimeters more, I see a completely clear image edge to edge with a 54 degree field of view. But I actually don't think the IPD, the distance between your eyes, is the issue with these goggles. You see, my friend Fubar Phil is the opposite to me. He has a narrow IPD and needs the sliders pushed fully inwards on Fat Shark HDO2 goggles. And with these goggles, he didn't need to do that. However, with the screen scaled at 90%, he was still seeing the same blurring and vignetting that I was seeing, and he experienced the same thing as me. You need to dial it down to about 80% before that goes away. Now, when you get down to 80% scaling of a 1080p 16x9 screen, you are losing resolution as well as field of view. So the image you are seeing is around 864p with a field of view of 40 degrees, not the advertised 51 degrees. And at this point, the user experience, in my opinion, is worse than the previous goggles. The image is so small that I'm not able to tell that the camera on the drone is actually better because it is better. You can liken it to watching a 27 inch 4K PC monitor from 15 feet away. You can't tell whether it's 4K, 1080p or even 720p. Now you would assume that scaling the goggles to 90 or 80% wouldn't affect the recording to the goggles DVR, but it actually does. Up until now, I've edited the goggles DVR to fit the screen, but this is actually what it records. You get a 1080p file recorded to the goggles with black bars around the edge. Now to DJI's credit, it does record the Avatar on-screen display to the goggles DVR which I like and it's something we've all been asking for with the vistas and air units but scaling down the resolution of the video file recorded to the goggles DVR when you scale down the size of the screen is a bonkers move to me and I'm sure that is something that they can fix in future firmware updates because it makes no sense. 
The good news is that the old V2 goggles support the Avata drone and hopefully are going to support the O3 Air unit, which displays an 810p, and that's not far off 864p that I'm getting with the goggles too, scaled down to 80% with a 40 degree field of view. Except with the older goggles, you have an edge to edge 54 degree field of view. And for anyone that has the first FPV drone that DJI released, the kind of image that you can expect out of it is what you will see through the older V2 goggles with the Avata drone and probably the O3 Air unit, which is an improvement over the original Vistas and Air units. Not by a lot, but it's enough to make you want to buy one, especially if it can be used as an action camera and you can use all of the gyro data, rock steady and all of that, then maybe it is worth it. The older V2 goggles also support Vistas and Air units, so it's a no-brainer for me that for the FPV hobby side, you would go for the bigger goggles. It's a hard pass for me on the goggles too. And stick with your old V2 goggles because yes, they might be bigger and heavier. And yes, you need to buy the upgraded DJI foam faceplate to make them comfortable, but it's a better user experience than the new goggles because guess what? The fitment on the face of the new goggles is even worse than the older ones. They don't wrap around my face, so there is light leak from the sides and under the nose somehow, and also my cheeks, despite the goggles completely crushing my nose and being really uncomfortable to wear for just a short period of time. Whereas the old V1 and V2 goggles, I would sit, you know, doing head tracking with those goggles for half an hour to 40 minutes sat down comfortably. It's like someone is pinching my nose shut and I'm having to breathe out of my mouth. And to pour salt into the wound, the faceplate is not Velcroed on, it uses clips. But that doesn't matter anyway because the only solution I see these goggles fitting my face perfectly is pushing them further away from my face, which then makes the vignetting and blurring even worse. So for me, Again, the goggles too are unusable. That vignetting and blurring, if I take the faceplate off and put my eyes closer to the screen, it gets better. But I don't see a solution where a modified faceplate could have them wrapped around my face and not crush my nose and I get a better image out of them. So I didn't expect any of this from the few videos I've seen because everyone was just hyping it up. Yeah, it's fantastic, a, a smaller form factor, great. But I feel like it's my duty to tell you that my advice is to stick with the older V2 goggles and wait to see if they get full support of the O3 Air unit. If not, then maybe the O3 Air unit isn't even for you. Anyway, let's talk about the thing that I thought I would mainly be talking about, and that is the video and the camera transmission system. Now, because it uses the FPV drone's user interface, and me being based in Europe, I'm limited to 25 milliwatt, and there is currently no way to unlock it. I've tried a VPN and a GPS location lock app, but it seems that as long as the drone knows from its own GPS that it's in Europe, it switches to 25 milliwatt. This might be different when it comes to a standalone air unit, as it probably won't have GPS, but everything has to be activated through the DJI app, which also has your location baked into it from your address that you have on your account. And if you don't allow the app any of the permissions it needs, then you'll be stuck at 25 milliwatt anyways. And I'm talking about the DJI Fly app. 
Now DJI does mention in its tutorials that you can activate the drone using a PC via the DJI Assistant app, which is not actually the FPV series that we use. It's the other one. I think it's called the consumer app or something like that. But anyways, I tried that using a VPN. However, the drone was still stuck in 25 milliwatt mode and the goggles gave an error that said aircraft not connected to DJI Fly. So as soon as I plugged the goggles into the phone app, it did a firmware update that was not available on the PC app, weirdly, and then the error went away. But my options are one channel and 25 milliwatt output. This is being worked on and is another reason for me getting the Avata drone because we know a lot more now how DJI locked down the power on their drones from the first FPV drone. But at the making of this video, if you are in Europe, 25 milliwatt is all you have. And DJI says it's good for two kilometers, but that is just nonsense. Maybe line of sight, yes. But in my experience, going around even just a tree 100 meters away caused signal loss issues and video stutters. Hopefully by the time the O3 Air unit has launched, we will have figured out how to unlock the power of the Avata drone and that hopefully will trickle down to the O3 Air unit because I have a sneaky suspicion that they are going to lock it down a lot more than they did with the original Air units in Vistas. As for the video quality, I think it's superb when you look at it on a computer. When you look at it through the goggles, I can't tell you whether the camera and the quality is better. I can't tell you if the transmission is better because I'm stuck at 25 milliwatts. But I was really impressed with the dynamic range of the camera footage and when Rocksteady was applied and also when Gyroflow was applied despite losing the field of view. As for the Avata drone, I think it's a much better product than the first official DJI FPV drone. People call it the potato so that we are all on the same page. The Avata's PIDs feel way more locked in than the first FPV drone. And I did a couple of stress tests. I did a cartwheel with it and it did get that your washout that we get with cine whoops and that's to be expected but actually you know it flew better than some binum flies that I have received that weren't cine whoops so that is definitely an improvement it's also very robust and has more replaceable parts but with bespoke batteries costing 109 quid that they will eventually stop making and them also locking down certain features just like they always do. I think the hobbyist is better building their own CineWoop, despite the prices being similar. And for the non-FPV hobbyist, I think this is a product that they are going to absolutely love. So there you go, that is my take on what I think we are to expect from the future of DJI products on the hobby side. If you enjoyed this video and want to support the channel so I can make more videos like this, I have a Patreon, which I'll link in the video description. There's also a PayPal link if you want to donate there and the new super thanks button. And super thanks to everybody that does that. It really does help keep the channel going. And as always, thanks so much for watching. Please continue to subscribe. Cheers.